Let's fill this room with worship. Come on, church. So when I fight, I fight on my knees with my hands lifting high. Go, the battle belongs to you. And everything I lay at your feet, I'll sit through the night. So God, the battle belongs to you. situation, God, in our everyday lives. The battle belongs to you, so we surrender everything to you, God. Let everything that we do give you glory and honor. Let every breath that we breathe, that we excel praise. And we thank you that you're just in this room right now doing miracles. Never be more loved than I am wasn't holding you up So there's nothing I can do to let you down It doesn't take a trophy to make you proud I'll never be more loved than I am right now Going through a storm, but I won't go down I hear your voice Ocean, so I wouldn't drown. 
voice in this room. I know who I am. I know. I know what you spoke. Come on, sing it loud. I'm already loved. I'm for you and I, amen. This morning, we're gonna receive communion. And there's always one little challenge in this because we do it every week. It can become just like a ritual and just the thing that we do. And there's so much more behind it this morning. And so I wanna challenge you that just as you may think it's just a part of the service, no, there's, it's an important part of the service because it brings us back to remembering the reason why we do communion family. Just like on Facebook, have you ever gotten those little reminders that it says five years ago or 10 years ago and it shows you a picture? Well, that's what communion's all about. It's getting us back to that place of thinking about, God, what is my covenant with you? Because the Bible says that when he shed his blood at that last supper and we partake of communion, right? It's because it was a finished work and he's reminding us that his body was broken for you and for me. So whatever you have need of, see, grace has created that bridge. We were, we were separated from God, but grace has opened up a bountiful blessings and benefits for you and I, and the benefits are found in his word. So you have to know his word. I had a scripture here in John chapter one, verse 14. It says, the word became flesh. This is talking about Jesus. And he made his dwelling among us. So God is wanting to bring you close, regardless of how you feel, how you perform. He's among you. Amen. And it says, um, we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son, Jesus, who came from the father. Now listen, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him he cried out saying this is the one I spoke about when I said he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me that's a little deep but it's okay it says out of his fullness we have all received grace in place of grace already given for the law was given through Moses grace and truth came through Jesus Christ so here's what you need to know grace has opened up a treasure full of blessings 
But you have to utilize the word. You have to believe in the word to get you across to receive those blessings. So it's up to you. If you have what you need, it's because you've gone. It's where faith comes in. So your faith is bridging that, bringing those blessings to you. But that grace and truth means that you've got to know the, you've got to know the word of God. So that when we come into receiving communion, if you have an ailment in your body, right? We're not denying the fact that maybe your back hurts or your leg hurts or you have something's going on. But what we're saying is the truth of God's word triumphs whatever those facts in your body are. Now, because we are children of God, we have that covenant that says, I can apply the word of God to my back, right? I can apply the word of God to my arm or whatever the case may be. But you've got to take the scripture of the word that says that he's healed us. And so in communion, we're reminded of that, of saying, God, when I partake of your body, it was broken for me so that I could be healed. And when I drink of your, the grape juice that represents the blood that was shed for you and I, right? It reminds us that our sins have been forgiven. They've not been covered up. They've been removed as far as for east from the west. So it takes away the performance off of you and I. The only thing that we have to do to perform is believe his word and speak his word so every time we come into communion it is this point of contact of saying yes God I'm hurting today but I know that your word says that you'll never leave me or forsake me or God I'm a little afraid but I know your word says to fear not for I am with you right God I feel a little bit alone and God says hey I have you as the apple of my eye I hold you in the palm of my hand that's what his word says so we have to live our life not according to the thoughts and patterns of this world, but we need to live our life according to the word. What does the word say? And so we grab a hold of that, amen? So this morning as we partake of this wafer, speak to yourself and speak to your body and speak the word of God that says, I am healed. He was broken for me so that I could be healed in every area of my life. Go ahead and partake. I love it, I love it, I love it. The Bible says, for the joy set before him, he he endured the cross. And family, that's your pictures that were flashing before him. He said, I can do it because I know Michelle's going to accept me one day. I can do this because I know that John is going to accept me one day. Amen. I can do this because I know Nicole is going to say yes to me. Amen. And so it was your picture that flashed before him. Go ahead and partake. Father, we thank you. We thank you. We thank you. And I pray that faith has been ignited and sparked in every person within my voice this morning. In Jesus' name. Let's continue to worship.
so much. We love the fact that you never let us down, and yet you're doing miracles, you're moving mountains upon us, Lord. We thank you for everything that you do, moving our hearts and in our minds, not just the mountains, Father God, but us. Move in us and through us, Lord, and we thank you for everything that you do. Hey, church, if you agree with me, you just give a big shout out, amen, to Jesus. Amen. And how are we doing, church? Are we joyful today? Come on. That's right. Hey, how come we don't look at the person next to us and be like, man, you look so great today? Welcome home church and welcome to Hope UC. I'm Pastor Jansen and this is my wife Julie and we're so blessed that you've joined us today. We want to welcome those of you who are joining us online. We're so happy that you're with us today. And if this is your first time in the building, be sure to check out the hub after service because we have a gift for you. And if this is your first time joining us online, please connect with us through the digital connect card. Our God is a God of breakthrough. So keep on believing keep on expecting that he has something good in store for you today. We love you, church, and we're just getting started. So get ready. It's going to be a great service. All right. Good morning. Hope you see. How are you doing? All right. Well, it is my honor to be up here sharing around our giving today. You know, at Hope You See, we believe that generosity is our honor. It truly is our honor to give back to God for all he's given us. Um, there's going to be several ways to give on the screen. You guys can give on the Hope You See app. Um, you can give online. You can give through Zelle. Or you could drop it off at one of our generosity locations located throughout the building. You know, I really felt the Lord put on my heart and give me a word for our offering today. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me patience. And I had to really think about that. I'm like, Lord, what does that have to do with offering, right? And so, but you know, God... God always knows, right? And so I was thinking of my little Harper. She's in TK this year, and they just started um, planting seeds in soil. And she's been talk coming home talking about it, and every day they're watching their plants to see if it starts to grow yet. And you know, those little TKers, they don't have a lot of patience, right? But they had to be patient, right? Because it takes a while for that plant for that seed to sprout and it to grow. Well, just this Friday, she came home and told us, she's like, mom, my seed started to grow. And I was like, yay. So it's just a, such an exciting moment for her. But what the Lord was sharing with me about patience, right, is when you're planting your seed, your tithe today, your 10%, you are planting into the kingdom of God, right? And so when you're planting your seed, you are going to reap a harvest because that's what the Bible says, right? And kind of just like Tanya shared, right? When we pour ourselves into the word, the word is true, okay? So when you're planting your seed, you're giving your tithes and your offerings today, I just want you to know that you will reap a harvest because that's what the Bible says. But I want you to be patient in that harvest, right? You may not you may not see the benefits right away. You may it may be 6 months from now you could get an unexpected check, right? But I just want you to be faithful. Um, just trust God in your giving and I believe me when you say it you will reap a harvest. And I just want to share from Galatians 6:9 today. It says, "So let's not get tired of doing what is good." At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. So I want to encourage you today to be patient in the waiting season for your seed to harvest. Amen? And if you're ever in a need, okay, you're going through something, I want you to remember in your moment of need, remember your seed. Okay, in your moment of need, remember your seed today that you planted, all right? All right, let's go ahead and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for today, Palm Sunday, Father God. I just thank you for um, everyone that is just putting their seed, Father God, putting you first, trusting the tithe, Father God, as we pour into your kingdom to see people saved, Father God. We just thank you for all that you're doing in our life and let us just have a blessed day and a
great week ahead. Amen. Let's watch church news. Hey church, can you believe Easter is just one week away? We're so excited to start off our Easter celebration this Friday with our Good Friday service at 7 p.m. Followed by our Easter Sunday services at 8.30, 10, and 11.30 a.m. Easter is the best time for us to invite our friends and family to experience the love and grace that Jesus has freely given to us through the cross. Amen. If you're believing for someone to have that encounter with Jesus, make sure to invite them. And we'll see you this Friday. Community is our heartbeat here at Hope, and our desire is that every person has the opportunity to get connected. If you're searching for that community, we would love to get to know you and give you the chance to get to know us through Starting Point. You can sign up for Starting Point on the app or you can visit the hub after service. King David was a young shepherd boy when he was anointed King of Jerusalem. Samuel the prophet was a young boy when he served in the tabernacle under the guidance of Eli the priest. Timothy, the spiritual son of the Apostle Paul was only 17 when he started pastoring one of the biggest mega churches at that time. Joseph, the son of Jacob, was only 17 when our Heavenly Father first spoke to him in a dream. One word from God changes everything. One encounter with God can change the whole trajectory of your life. One summer night can be the catalyst for a life of purpose and fulfillment for your child. Welcome to Unlimited Summer Camp 2024. Get ready because Unlimited Summer Camp is back and better than ever. Mark your calendars for Friday, June 21st through Sunday, June 23rd as we embark on an incredible journey nestled in the breathtaking mountains of Santa Barbara. We are calling all 6th to 12th grade students. This is your exclusive invitation to a weekend that promises to be one of the most transforming experiences of your child life at unlimited summer camp your child will embark on a thrilling journey to encounter the presence of god and deepen their relationship with jesus christ picture this live worship sessions next to a campfire surrounded by their friends interactive biblical teachings that ignite the spirit and heart pounding group activities with a summer field of unforgettable memories come meet us in the church lobby and register your child today or visit us on the hope you see app if you would like to sponsor a child, meet us in the church lobby today. Stay connected by following us on Facebook and Instagram at Hope UC Los Angeles. For more info and all things Hope UC, visit us online at HopeUC.com. Well, welcome home, church. How's everybody doing today? You guys are blessed to be in God's house today. Come on, whether you're in the building or online, we're so glad that you're worshiping with us today. Uh, you know, we are just one week away from Easter Sunday. Amen. We're so excited for what God is going to do here on Easter Sunday. Hey, we added an extra service, as you saw in the news, 8.30 a.m. We would love uh, for you to join us early if you are an early riser. Amen. Uh, it's going to be a great day. And, and I just encourage you, invite someone uh, to experience the same hope the same grace, the same love that you have as well. And so it's going to be a great day in God's house. Well, today is Palm Sunday, uh, and today marks the beginning of the week, come on, that leads us to Easter Sunday. And, and we call it Palm Sunday because it was uh, when Jesus is making his uh, triumphal entry into Jerusalem, they, ra they laid the palm branches on the road before him. And at that time, palm branches were often used in celebration of victory. And in King David's time, they were used to honor royalty. And this fact and this history of these palm branches really was just a foreshadowing of the true identity of Jesus as our King of Kings and our Lord of Lords. Amen. Amen. Uh, but there was another thing that they laid that day that didn't get as much hype. It didn't have as good of a PR firm, right? It's Palm Sunday, but it could have been another name for that Sunday. Uh, let's take a look at that was Luke chapter 19. If you're taking notes, you can follow along on the Hope You See app or on the screen. Luke 19, 
verse 30 through 36, he said, Go into the town ahead of you. There you will find a young donkey tied. No man has ever sat on it. Let it loose and bring it to me. If anyone asks you, why are you letting it loose? Say to him, because the Lord needs it. Can we just pause right there for just a second? I got more scriptures to breathe. But this is exactly the scenario we talked about last week. If you're here last week, I talked about our street smart people and our book smart people and our spirit smart people. You guys remember that? This is that exact scenario playing out where Jesus tells them to go do something. And I guarantee you on the way, they're like, this is a bad idea. I don't like this one bit. We are going to look so stupid just walking up to this donkey. And then we're just going to, we're just supposed to say, Jesus said he needs it. Like, what if they say, get the heck out of here? What are you talking about? And they had to move with some faith. Amen. Uh, Like they had to be sure that Jesus was asking them to do this because it would have been embarrassing if it didn't work. But then this is what happens in verse 32. Those who were sent found everything as Jesus had told them. As they were letting the young donkey loose, the owner said to them, why are you letting the young donkey loose? They answered, the Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus. They put their coats on the donkey and they put Jesus on it. As they were going, they put their coats down in the road, which brings me to the title of the message today, lay down your coat. Come on, look at your neighbor. Look at somebody next to you and tell them, neighbor, lay down your coat. I feel like the palm branches have got enough love. We're going to be talking about the coats today, amen. See, a coat was so much more valuable than a palm branch. Come on, anybody could go find a palm branch, but a coat... A coat was everything to them. It would keep them warm. They would sleep with their coats. It wasn't like they had a coat closet. How many of you got a coat closet at home, right? My wife's got a coat closet, you know, you got coat. They just had a coat. It was singular. They had one coat. It meant so much to them. When they laid down their coat, they were saying, Lord, we give you everything. What I use to cover me, I'm going to lay it down before you so that you cover me. Amen. You see, this was his triumphant entry. And the Jews at the time were looking for a king. They thought their savior, their Messiah, Jesus, was coming to save them from their present condition, to save them from the Romans and to establish a new kingdom here on earth. And yes, he was coming to save them, but not in the way that they thought. And I don't know about you, but I feel like in my own life, Jesus is always working in ways that I would never have thought. Come on, when I was doing media for the church, I never would have thought I would be doing student ministries. And when I was doing student ministries, I never thought I would become executive pastor. And when I was executive pastor, I never thought that I would become lead pastor. If we continue to lay down our plans for his plans, we will see him work in ways that we never thought. Amen. See, they were looking for an earthly king, but he was coming to be their eternal king. See, when we say yes to Jesus, he becomes our eternal king. When we say, Lord, we give you our life, we we lay down our old life, and we are born again into a new life in Christ. But how many of you know, even though we may say yes to Jesus on a Sunday, Monday's still coming, amen? (laughs) Right? Uh, We still have to go to our jobs on Monday. We still have to go to our family gatherings. We still have a life that we've got to walk through, and there's still things that we have to daily lay down before Jesus. You know, last week I talked about the Holy Spirit being our ultimate guide, and I had an acronym for the word guide that I revealed to you at the end of that message. Well, today I don't have a sneak attack acronym for you guys today, amen? Instead, I'm going to give it to you at the beginning. How about that? See, God is calling each and every one of us to lay down our coat, our cares, our offenses, our attitudes, and our things. Come on, we need to lay down our cares, we need to lay down our offenses, we need to lay down our attitudes, and we need to lay down our things. Lay down your coat. And so we're going to jump into that this morning. Key number one, cast your cares. Look at your neighbor and tell them, neighbor, 
Cast your cares. First Peter 5, 7 says it like this. Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. You know who doesn't have a care in the world? My kids. They really do not have any cares in this world. Uh, they go to sleep at every, every night with just a sweet, peaceful sleep. Uh, they don't think twice about where their next meal is coming from. They know beyond a shadow of a doubt that their mom and their dad are always going to supply everything that they need, that they're always going to have a place to sleep. They're always going to have clothes on their back, thanks to their mom who likes to shop, amen. <laughs> They're always going to be well-dressed and have everything that they need and because their mom and their dad supply all of their needs. And we are all children of God, amen? So why are we walking through life with so much worry? Why are we always concerned about everything that the world has to offer us? It's time to cast our cares on the Lord. That's why the Bible tells us in Matthew 6 not to worry about what we eat or what we drink or what we wear. It says in Matthew 6, 25, I'll read it to you. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? You see, all we have in our life is time. Our most limited resource is not food. It's not finance. Our most limited resource that we have is our time and worrying about things of this world. So it's time that we lay down our worries, we lay down our burdens, we lay down our cares. And if we can lay uh, these things down today because of how much God cares for us, how much God loves us. You see, it's one thing to say, amen, pastor, uh, I'm going to lay down my cares. It's the other thing to have the faith not to pick it back up. Right, so you can lay it down today on Sunday, but Monday morning when that email box hits and you get some bad news and then you pick that worry right back up or that phone rings and it's that person that you don't really want to talk to and they call you and you just hit that red, isn't that decline button just real nice? Just, oh, look at that. Right, you know, and we could pick back up those worries when that bill arrives in the mail and we pick up that worry again, but don't lay it down for a season, lay it down for a lifetime, Amen. They say that, uh, you know, opposites attract, and it's so true with me and my wife. She likes to worry a little bit. I'll just say a little bit. And you see, I'm on the opposite end of the spectrum where I'm like, should I be worried? I don't know. I'm not, you know, she makes me feel like maybe I'm not worried enough, you know? And I, sometimes I get in trouble because I'm like, I'm, I'm, maybe I'm not worried. I should be a little more worried. You see, I like to say worrying is like a rocking chair. It just gives you something to do, but it doesn't get you anywhere, right? Come on, somebody. See, we really have nothing to worry about if we really pull back and get a God-sized picture of our lives, we can see that he's got us in the palm of his hand. Come on, if you're in this room today, if you're watching online today, that means you're watching with a tablet or a TV or a smartphone. Come on, you've got all that you need and there is nothing to be worried about. Uh, I spent this past week at an event with one of our ministry partners, Convoy of Hope, and I got to hear some of the stories of people that really don't know where their next meal is coming from. Uh, they, they're in villages and they're in these towns where uh, even if they had money, they can't just go buy food because there is no food in sight. They, they are fighting over food because of the lack of food supply. And so when you hear these stories of, uh, of these people that really don't know where their next meal is coming from and, and these amazing organizations like Convoy of Hope that, that brings hope, that shows up on the scene and says there's people on the other side of the world that are supporting you so that we can bring hope to you in your time of need and not just to meet your practical need, but your spiritual need as well. Amen. And so when you hear those stories, you think, man, I got nothing to worry about. God has got me in the palm of his hand. Amen. 
The next thing this morning we need to lay down is offense. Key number two, no offense. Come on, look at your neighbor and tell him, neighbor, no offense, but no, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> See, you know when someone says no offense, what they're about to do is say something that's going to offend you. That's the only reason they say no offense. They're just trying to get themselves off the hook to say something offensive. See, Proverbs 19, 11 says, good sense makes one slow to anger, and it is his glory to overlook an offense. Come on, they say in sports, sometimes a good offense is a good defense. Well, the same true is in our life is if we get offended, we get defensive, right? Come on. See, there's things that happen to us when we get offended. Write these things down if you're taking notes. Three things that happen to us when we get offended. Number one, it separates. You see, when we allow ourselves to take offense, it separates us from others around us. It produces a we versus me attitude. It makes you feel like everyone is out to get you, right? And then the second thing it does is it escalates. Usually if you get offended, the first thing that you do is you tell other people that you were offended. Uh, You invite people into your pity party of one. Can you believe what this person did to me? Come on, can you believe that they stole my seat, right? And you get offended and then you're all, you're all hurt, right? Can you believe it? And, and see, we can't allow it to escalate. Number three, it paralyzes. Living a life of offense will often paralyze you and it will leave you stuck and you don't advance to the level where God wants you to go because you can't extend forgiveness. Offense escalates. It separates and it paralyzes us. That's why the Bible tells us, come on, how many of you know it's good to know what the Bible tells us? 1 Corinthians 13, 5 says, love takes no account of the evil done to it. It pays no attention to a suffered wrong. Come on, we can read that in church on Sunday, but how many you know it's very difficult to live out on a Monday, right? Uh, the person who walks in love takes no account of evil committed against them. The world would love to tell us to get even, but when we take no account, we don't get even with anyone who has wronged us. Instead, we refuse to give the injustice, the offense, the wrong, the attention that it demands. You see, when the opportunity to get offended presents itself, uh, I take no account, I pay no attention, I encourage you to do the same as well. It will work wonders for your life. You know, One of the distinguishing characteristics of someone who has allowed offense to become rooted in them is this desire to get even, right? Uh, When the person who hurt them experiences some kind of uh, tragedy, you think, well, good, they had it coming, right? Uh, Jesus accomplished the greatest act of forgiveness and refusal, refusal of offense on the cross, Come on, the same people who praised him today on Palm Sunday and who laid down their coats were the same people who said, crucify him on Good Friday. And it would have been very easy for him to take offense. But instead, when he was on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Amen. Notice Jesus didn't say, Father, kill them. Pay them back for the wrong that they committed. No, he said, show them grace. Show them forgiveness. Forgive the offenders. And he's asking the Father to not hold their sins against them. So how do we stay in a posture that is unoffendable? How many of you want to be unoffendable? Amen? Five of you. Great. (laughs) We're working on it. We're a work in progress. How do we stay unoffendable? We lower our expectations of people. And we raise our expectations of God. Come on, people, people are going to offend you. People are going to let you down. People are going to disappoint you. So let's lower our expectations of man and instead raise our expectations of God. Amen. Amen. The next thing we are going to have to lay down this morning is our attitude. Come on, it just keeps getting easier and easier. Amen. <laughs> Key number three, your attitude sets your altitude. Ephesians 4, through 23 says, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. 
Come on, we have to lay down our old attitudes and allow the Holy Spirit to renew our thoughts and our attitudes. You know, an attitude will take you so much farther than your aptitude. You know, how much, how smart you are, how intelligent you are, doesn't mean much if you have a negative attitude. And if we want God to take us into the more uh, that he has for us this year, then we're going to have to uh, have an attitude checkup. Come on. Have you offended anybody with your attitude? Amen. You don't need to raise your hands. It's okay. (laughs) Don't tap your neighbor. Look at your spouse. One of our kids, uh, I'm not going to throw any of our kids under the bus, but one of our kids, we find ourselves continually saying, watch the attitude. Come on. How many of you know it's not what you say, sometimes it's how you say it, right? More than just words, what you say, how you say them matters even more. Your tone It conveys your emotions and your thoughts. Are you being passionate and proud? Are you being condescending and dismissive? Come on. The same phrase said in different ways can mean very different things. If I said, whatever you want, babe, or whatever you want, babe. Come on. I'm getting two different responses. I said the same thing. It's all on how you say it. Perception is reality. So even if you say something that feels sincere to you, the person could hear it completely different, amen? And it becomes the reality. So how's our attitude to our boss? How's our attitude to our teachers? How's our attitude to our spouses? How is our attitude to our loved ones? We need to let the Holy Spirit renew our attitude and to show us ways where we can be more loving and really can just start by uh, what we say and how we say it. Come on, it says if you're happy, and you know it, then you're, no, not clap your hands. <laughs> Wrong song. If you're happy and you know it, your face will surely show it. Is it then it goes, if you're happy and you know it, clap your hands? Okay, you got, you got ahead of me, you got ahead of me. See, and the opposite is true as well. If you're not happy, everyone else around you is going to know it. And your face will absolutely show it. So we need to lay down our attitude, and we need to pick up an attitude of gratitude, an attitude that raises your altitude to the more that God has for you. Come on. If anyone could have had an attitude, it would have been Jesus. Come on. Yet on this Palm Sunday, instead of running away from Jerusalem, he went, get me that donkey, let it loose. It's time to go. It's time to go towards my purpose, even though it's going to be painful, even though there's pain ahead, I'm walking into the purpose that God has for me. Amen. Uh, Key number four this morning, uh, don't make things a thing. Come on, look at your neighbor one more time. Tell him, neighbor, don't make it a thing. Have you ever let your things become a thing? Become the thing that holds you back from all that God has for you. You see, we see in the book of Mark when the rich young ruler went to Jesus and asked him, what is needed for me to do to inherit eternal life? And this was Jesus' response to that rich young ruler. He says in Mark chapter 10, 21 through 22, Looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love for him. There is still one thing. Someone say one thing. There is still one thing you haven't done, he told him. Go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this, the man's face fell, and he went away sad, for he had many possessions. You see, we laid down our cares, we laid down our offense, we laid down our attitudes, and Jesus tells us, but wait, there's still one more thing you haven't done. See, you can't grab a hold of Jesus if you're still holding on to the things of this world. Most people read this passage and think it's about money, and that in order to follow Jesus, you have to sell all of your stuff and you have to be poor, but that's not what Jesus is saying at all. He knew this man's heart and he was telling him, for you, rich young ruler, for you, the one thing that's holding you back 
is your trust in your things. So Jesus said, I'm gonna need you to lay down the thing that's become the thing. And see, we can sit here and say, yeah, I'll lay down my finances, but that's not a thing for you. Why don't you lay down the drugs? Why don't you lay down the alcohol? Why don't you lay down the attitude? Why don't you lay down the offense? Why don't you lay down the cares? See, we're so quick to lay down the thing that's not a thing. And Jesus is saying, no, I got one more thing and you need to lay down the thing that's become a thing for you. And so have you allowed your finances to become a thing? Have you allowed drugs to become a thing? Have you allowed worry and care to become a thing? Jesus saying to each and every one of us today to lay down the things of this world and to follow him with everything that he had. See this rich young ruler, he failed to realize that if he laid down what was currently in his hand, that on the other side of that, yes, God had so much more for him. God had so much more for him on the other side of his yes. All he could see was what was currently in his hand. He thought that he would be left with nothing. Little did he realize he would have access to everything. You see, he was content with earthly treasure instead of the eternal treasure that God had for him. So today, as we lay down our coats, as we lay down our cares, our offenses, our attitudes, I would encourage you not to stop there and to say, God, what's that one thing? What's that one thing for me? Make it personal. Say, Holy Spirit, show me, reveal to me the one thing I've been holding on to, the one thing I haven't been willing to let go of, and make today the day where you lay down your thing before Jesus. Would you pray with me today, Father? We thank you for each and every person in here as we come before you as we lay down our cares, our offenses, our attitudes, and our things before you, Father. We thank you uh, that you make a way for us, Father God, that you go before us. Today, I want to speak personally to those of you today, those of you that have never had an opportunity to say yes to Jesus, never had that opportunity to come into a relationship with a Father who loves you completely right where you're at. And today, He wants to wrap his arms around you. He wants to tell you how much he loves you, how much he's been waiting for this moment uh, to come into a life-giving, life-fulfilling relationship with you. The Bible says that two things are required, an open heart and an open mouth. If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, then you shall be saved. And three incredible things will happen. Your sins will be forgiven. Heaven will be your eternal home and God will become your father and will always be with you. So if that's you today and you desire that relationship, if you want to say yes to Jesus, go all in and lay down your things and pick up a relationship with Jesus, all I'm going to ask you to do is to raise your hand. Raise it up high right now. Say, I'm saying yes to Jesus. I'm saying yes to relationship with him. Thank you for those hands. I see those hands. Thank you for those two hands over there. I see those hands. Thank you for that hand right there. Thank you for that hand. Thank you for that hand back there. Come on, hands going up all over of people saying yes to Jesus. Well, what we're going to do, church, is we're going to pray. All of us together, repeat after me. Say it loud, say it bold. Dear God, forgive me of my sins. Jesus, save me and make me new. My life is not my own. I give it all to you. Fill me with your spirit so I could follow you. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your love. And I thank you for my new life in you. In Jesus' mighty name, somebody said amen. Amen, would you stand with me? Let's worship our Father together, amen.
All right. Can we celebrate those who said yes to Christ this morning? All those hands raised. We are just so proud of you and that decision you made to follow Christ. You know, we'd like you to do something after service. We have a bell. It's in the lobby. We'd love for you to stop by and ring it. You'll see our church family. We'll cheer you on because you just made the best decision of your life. Amen. We'd also like to give you a t-shirt. It says part of the family since you joined the greatest family here on earth. Amen. Also, if you're in need of prayer today, we have our prayer team out at our prayer center. They just love to pray with you, agree with you, stand in faith with you for whatever you believe in God for. Amen. Well, how many of you are blessed? You're at church today. Amen. Come on. We would love to see you. Good Friday, seven o'clock. Get here early. Two services into one. So get here early to find a seat. It's going to be a powerful time. And then Easter Sunday, 8 30, 10, 11 30. We're going to celebrate the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen. Well, let us bless you as we get ready to go. Romans 15, 13 says, I pray, I pray that God, who is the source of hope, will fill us completely with joy and peace because we place our trust in him. Then we will overflow with the confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We love you, church. We love you guys. We'll see you on Friday.